Welcome to Health Oddity, the show that strips away the jargon and hype surrounding all things health and fitness to help you live a long, strong and energetic life. Lining up at the bar this week, here's Peter Lant, Paul Bassett and James St. Pierre. Hello and welcome to episode 10 of the Health Oddity podcast. So I'm just going to say hello to uh, Peter Lant, who sat to my left. Hello. Hello to Paul Bassett, who's sat directly underneath me. Hello. <laughs> and also uh, hello to our very, very special guest all the way joining us from the United States, uh, California, uh, Tracy Rifkind. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, so just to just to uh, let guys know that it's one half past one in the afternoon in England where we're recording this, and uh, and Tracy's got up very early. It's half past six in the morning where where she is at the moment. So um, just a very quick introduction uh, about Tracy uh, for those of you who don't know. I know some of you will definitely know Tracy if you're involved in kettlebells and you're in the fitness industry. But obviously, lots of our listeners are uh, not trainers, are just people who are interested in living a more healthy, energetic life and getting stronger and fitter and more healthy and that sort of thing. So I've known Tracy for, um, it's got to be at least five or six years now, I think. We've done a number of uh, certifications together, which I've uh, taken part where Tracy's uh, been, been instructing and been coaching um, uh, at other venues. And also I think Tracy's been to Unique Results two or three times. Uh, in Chelmsford and we had a fantastic which we will talk about later she came and we did a, a swing lean uh, workshop and swing lean session at Unique Results as well which was great so uh, Tracy is a, is a world-renowned kettlebell instructor an expert she's an author of the book The Swing Lose the Fat and Get Fit she's creator of the swing lean system and if you see her well I'd recommend you follow her on Instagram as well she is a highly talented baker as well and some of her cookies and things they would not look out of place on the great british bake-off which uh, is something that we have over here which is uh, is fantastic so um welcome tracy to the health oddity podcast thank you i'm delighted to be here i can't wait to get into the conversation because i love this subject Okay, fantastic and when we when we set this up i said to you that kind of the demographic or the people that really myself, Peter, uh, Paul, all kind of work with ma majority of our members are probably, uh, you know, 40 plus, certainly 35 upwards. And many of my members are in their 50s and 60s. So, right. it's, it's, so that's kind of who we're talking to uh, in the podcast. So I don't know, Tracy, if to begin with, maybe you could just tell us a little bit about um, about yourself, about, I mean, you've got a fantastic story and a fantastic journey, obviously yourself. Just tell us a little bit about you and, you know, how you came to be, to be where you are today. Sure. Well, I was thinking about the age demographic as I was getting ready for this uh, interview. And uh, this all happened for me when I was 41 years old. So up until that point, I had spent my entire life being overweight and uh, eventually morbidly obese. So um, that's not any kind of, you know, thing that you should take lightly. So I was never thin in my life, except for momentarily, you know, crash diets and that sort of thing. But so at 41, um, a lot of things happened to me kind of simultaneously. Um, one of the things that was really on my mind was, uh, dying <laughs> is that when you start thinking about it when you're 40. <laughs> yep. um, it's my birthday today I'm 41 so I mean so I started thinking about having a heart attack and all kinds of stuff and I knew that the things that I were thinking about that was going to kill me was probably related to the fact that I was so fat and I started thinking, you know what, if I die because I'm fat, Mark is going to be really pissed off. So, you know, like really. So um, the other thing that happened was um, at that year, the, great, the Biggest Loser, do you guys have a show similar to that? The Biggest Loser where, you know, a bunch of fat people get together and try to lose weight faster than anybody else. 
Yeah, we have. Um, that, we actually have the the American Biggest Loser on over here, and we've also, I think, we've had a British version and an Australian yeah. version, and yeah. Yeah. Both, yeah. So uh, that season had just played, and um, uh, the people at work decided to do the same thing: have a bet, right? That uh, whoever could lose the most amount of uh, weight in proportion to their beginning weight percentage of weight in three months. So it was a three month challenge. So um, I was the fattest person. I worked in a salon at the time. I was the fattest person there. I was, I'm, I was used to being the fattest person wherever I was at. Um, but they didn't ask me to be part of the, the bet. I walked in and everybody's taking their picture and all their before stats. And I'm like, what's going on? And they're like, oh, we're going to do this bet. And I'm like, uh, what about me? Like, you know, why wasn't I included in this? And, but I understand why I wasn't because at the time I had what I call fat pride and I knew I was fat. I didn't apologize for it. I'd go in and say, oh yeah, I ate a tub of ice cream last night or, you know, this and that. I tried, I didn't know it at the time, but I was, it was a defense mechanism. You know, it was a defense mechanism that just said, uh, you know what, I can't help it. It's genetics. I'm just going to be this way. And if I'm going to be this way, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, pretend to be something else. So I understand why they didn't ask me. They didn't think I was interested in losing weight, but I kind of took it as, uh, oh, uh, you know what? You guys don't know me. All right. You put some money on the table, you put a deadline on it. And this girl is going to kick some ass. So um, it lit a fire under my ass, like a fire hadn't been lit before. And uh, in three months, I lost 50 pounds. Wow. I went, actually, I lost more than 50 pounds. I went from 254 pounds to 200 mm. in three months. And I won the bet. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so I had, I didn't know about kettlebells at the time, but obviously uh, that night I had decided to lose 100 pounds. That, there was no question in my mind that I was going to lose 100 pounds. That would have taken me to 150, which is still overweight by, by a lot of people's standards. Um, so um, I lost my train of thought. But I knew I was going to lose the weight. And um, so like a lot of people in The Biggest Loser, I didn't, I didn't go out and go balls to the wall exercise because I couldn't, because I was heavy. And I heard you guys talk about walking a lot. I talk about it. I write about it in my book. I talk about it all the time. The very first thing I did is we had a walking trail where I lived and it's two, a little over two miles. And I walked that damn trail every single day. And on Sundays, I did a double loop, four miles. And my lower back hurt so bad. And But you know what? On my walk, this is, I think this is what, made a huge difference is on my walk, I visualize my body changing. I had a conversation with my body. And one of the conversations that I had, because like I mentioned earlier, heart attack was something I was really afraid of having. Heart disease in women was, you know, starting to come to the forefront that it was more common uh, than people thought. And even though I have low blood pressure, I'm not going to have a heart attack. I'm cool. Um, but, um, I would have a conversation with my heart and I'd be walking, you know, and I'd be going, you know what? I got you. I'm going to take care of you. I am going to melt this fat that I've been surrounding you with. And I literally saw the fat dripping off of my heart as I walked every step I took, I saw th that step as stronger, more driven more inspired, more motivated. It, nothing, nothing, no one was going to stop me. And there you go. Here I am. You know, so many things have happened since then. But when I look back on it, I didn't even know what I was doing. Uh, but looking back on it, I can see why it worked for me. Um, and then I could tell other people, this is why it worked for me. Um, so anyway, moving on, I ended up losing a bunch of weight. And at that time I found myself uh, 50 pounds lighter and Mark was just, if, uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm happy to be married to one of the most brilliant kettlebell instructors ever, master instructor, Mark Rifkin. Um, so 
he had already discovered the kettlebell. And um, uh, of course, we owned a gym. I mean, he, you know, he's been a ath competitive athlete his whole life. We owned a gym uh, for a number of years. I was fat. So when I started this uh, bet, it was really funny because um, everybody said, oh, it's not fair. Uh, you, you're married to a personal trainer. You know, and I'm like, yeah, a lot of good that's done me already. I've been very <laughs> over 100 pounds overweight, right? How, how much good has it done me? So um, uh, he had discovered the kettlebell. And about after my first initial weight loss with walking and changing my diet drastically uh, from eating a tub of ice cream and fast food twice a day to making all of my own food, uh, measuring, weighing, you know, all that good, all that fun stuff, because it was fun. All right? It wasn't tedious. It wasn't horrible. It was fun. Um, so he introduced me to the kettlebell he, uh, right here, right here on this platform. Um, that's amazing. I'm just like got chills right now, right here on this very platform. I did my first swing in 2005 and he showed me how to do a swing and I'm like, okay, get out now. Go away. Um, because in 2005, this thing, oh my goodness, oh, this thing was like medieval. All right, you guys can relate to medieval, but over here, you know, it was kind of freaky. So um, I didn't want anybody to know I was doing something with this thing. Uh, I mean, Mark, you know, have you, have you guys ever had a loved one try to coach you? Either they're your best coach or you, you can't stand it. No, but I've tried, I've tried to coach my wife before and it's not, it's not gone particularly well. So I don't know if, uh, I think Paul, you know, phases where it's good. And then it's sometimes it, you know, it <laughs> depends. I have to choose my time to give advice. I know exactly. I cannot be coached by Mark directly. Um, indirectly for sure, because I wouldn't be who I am today if it wasn't for him. Um, so anyway, that's, that's why... sorry, go on. No, no, no. You no, I was saying that that's an interesting thing that you've made this massive. I mean, the the mass the jump that a lot of people fail fail to make. I say fail, but don't make is that it doesn't matter the knowledge that you have. You, you suddenly made a very very strong decision, one that you have, have kept to this day, mm -hmm. to make that change and to and so you also used a couple of words which which chime with my story but i also think it's very useful for anyone else and you you started being excited about the acquisition of knowledge and discovering uh, all these different areas of your uh, abilities and and what the world has to give you and i think that's a very fruitful way of uh, undergoing weight loss and changing your body it becomes less about the number and more about personal development but the number is important the number is important. I mean, you cannot, like, I don't, I, I tell people, don't make excuses. If you want to be 120 pounds or you want to be 180 pounds, like, first of all, don't tell anybody what you're doing because it's nobody's damn business but yours. Because a lot of times, <clears throat> for instance, I had a massive weight loss in a very short amount of time. I guarantee you, if a woman walked into your gym at 250 pounds today and said, you know what? I want to lose 50 pounds in the next three months. You would have big reservations about that. You would probably discourage her, if anything. So, and you're professionals. And I'm an example of somebody who is successful at starting my weight loss there. Um, so I have a different view of that whole thing. Um, when people say, I, one of the things I heard so many times was, well, wasn't that unhealthy to lose that much weight uh, that fast? And <clears throat> it was unhealthy being 250 pounds for a, a very long time. That was much more unhealthy than uh, eating correctly. Like how unhealthy is eating correctly? I don't think that's very unhealthy. I just happened to go from zero to 60 very fast or 60 to zero, I should say. Um, very fast. I made ch big changes very quickly, but I didn't make, I didn't starve. I didn't fast. I didn't, you know, I had healthy food, um, a good amount of calories every single day. I had a, a 
ex, uh, you know, treats on the weekends. So uh, nothing I did, absolutely nothing I did was unhealthy. So, I mean, would you say that, I mean, one of the reasons people say that to you is that actually the scale of what you achieved is, is quite, is, is quite enormous because a lot, a lot of people don't, don't make that kind of progress. And so they why is, why is, I'm sorry. Why is losing 50 pounds enormous, but gaining 50 pounds isn't enormous? Because culturally people we have, have very at, different perceptions, don't we? People have to look at, oh, wait a minute here. I've done something really enormous in the wrong direction. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What? So, so going back, I didn't do anything enormous. I'm, I'm normal. I think, I think what's funny with what you've just said as well is, is, you know, like, obviously, if someone comes in and says, like, I want to lose weight very quickly, where, you know, like you say, as professionals, we're going to be like, well, okay, it's not necessarily the best way to do it. But if someone's really ready, if they're like, I am ready to go, they're, they're going to do it. Why is it not the best way? But not for everybody. Not for everybody, because people can do that and then give up after the three months and put it all back on I'm, again. I'm so it, whether, not, like, that's I'm, the way I would look at it. I'm not here to tell everybody what's right for them. I no. don't know what's right for anybody. So I can't say, um, yeah, you're one of the everybody and you're not. So, you know what? I think that this, this, um, it's, it's not a prejudice. Yeah, I don't know. I could go on and on and on about this. Um, I don't think that it's anybody's place to tell somebody else what they can and what they cannot do. The, no. Our bodies are amazing. If we can put on 100 pounds, we certainly can take off 100 pounds. And why do people say, I can gain it faster than I can lose it? Why? You should be able to lose it just as fast as you gained it, if not faster. Just start being a regular, normal person. But the thing is, I mean, lots of people's habits are geared around what they currently do to create their level of health as it stands. And absolutely. actually what they're talking about is like a complete change in direction, which is scary for a lot of people. So they see it as extreme because everything is set up in their life to, to take them in one direction. And then there's something- part of, part of why it's scary is because you don't have too many cheerleaders like me saying, you can do it. Mm. You can do something extreme if that's what you want to do that you don't, I mean, especially in the fitness and health in industry, people are like, Oh, whoa, 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 wait a minute here. Slow down. Um, I mean, I'm not trying to be irresponsible. All right. Um, but what I'm saying is that one of the reasons I think that um, these limitations have been put on most people is because nobody talks about more people like me. I'm not the only one. I mean, uh, you're, you're an amazing 12 coach, right? Yeah. I mean, amazing, not eh, kind of, uh, you know, it's an okay 12 week program. No, it's an amazing program. So yeah. it's like, why, why do we limit anybody on being amazing? We're all amazing. And as far as habits go, I'm totally with you on that. I totally am down with the habits and the behaviors and all that stuff. But everybody has had something in their life where they've changed on a dime. Yeah. It might not be fitness and eating, but there's been something, something in their life where they walked into a situation and they said, you know what? I'm not going to do that anymore. Cold turkey, change on a dime. Cigarette, alcohol. Or, or even something, not even a bad habit necessarily. Sometimes it's a good habit. Sometimes we, you know, we used to do something every day and then didn't do it anymore. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so um, all I'm saying is I don't generalize and I don't, I don't, um, I want to break those, those old, old, that old thinking that, 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 um, yeah, that, that uh, amazing things aren't possible because amazing things happen all the time, every single day. 
Well, I mean, every client who sits down in front of you with a different set of goals, a different set of aspirations. And, and, and in the end, we, 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 don't, we, we facilitate their dreams and their hopes and their focus. And, and however that wants to be expressed is, is our job to make sure that, that, they, that they get there and they have fun and then they do, it, they do it with the best possible environment around them. Uh, and like you say, I do, I do think it's, it's great to hear this kind of perspective because it really does put the power in the hands of the client. Uh, and show you that the human potential for change is massive. It's it's massive. It's massive. And I want to thank you very much, by the way. You mentioned a book called Peak a couple podcasts ago. Man, I love that book. Love it, love it, love it, love it. Thanks for recommending it. If you guys haven't read it, you should read it. Um, so in that book, what I'm finding so amazing is he's talking about this new generation of, of, of older people. Um, because the book Peak is about how, uh, how would you describe it? About purposeful practice. Is that what a deliberate practice, it, purposeful yeah. practice? Yeah. And how to, how to uh, improve your skill deliberately, right? And he talks a lot about how uh, the author uh, writes a lot about how uh, children, right? children, um, you would think that a gymnast, a dancer, a musician, if they started when they were children. But there's a part of the book where he talks about adults, about a gentleman that started golfing when he was 32 and turned into be a pro, right? So, I mean, you look at those kind of things and I think that there's more and more people uh, getting back to who we're talking to, uh, to this morning and about, more and more people that find themselves approaching 40 or older and they're not getting a whole lot of support to be super awesome to choose something and say hey you know what you can be the best at that if you want to be in your age group (laughs) (laughs) in a master's competition um but so what who cares you know it's it's about uh, it's about being inspired to reach for something that you maybe thought wasn't possible, um, and and making it um, and making it happen. Weight loss is one of those things. Getting fit is one of those things. I know um, uh, Paul. I'm sorry, Peter and Paul. Okay, uh, you you mentioned GS Sport. I mean, I got into uh, competing kettlebells at, in 2013. And it changed my kettlebell world. You know, it's like I just qualified for candidate for master of sport in the kettlebell marathon. I uh, snatched the 16 kilo for 30 minutes straight without putting it down. And I wasn't even doing it on purpose. That was part of my workout that day. It wasn't until after I finished it, I happened to videotape it, um, that Mark said, you know what? I think that qualifies you for candidate for master of sport. And I'm like, Oh, all right, we'll send the video in. So there you go. So, I mean, at, I think I did that two years ago at 55 years old uh, to qualify for candidate for master of sport in, in, a, in a legitimate a competitive sport, you know, without even trying. It was my own foundational training that gave me the ability to, uh, you know, decide. It took me about two and a half months to train for that. I wasn't training for the competition necessarily. I what that was my goal was to do it for thirty minutes continuous. Um, so, you know that that's pretty that's pretty amazing. That's tough. <laughs> Trust me, I know that's tough. How many, how many men can do that? Hardly any. Hardly any. Yeah. So no, they, they, they they were just. I mean, it, it, the the level of focus and the, the ability to deal with with just discomfort. For that period of time, because essentially it is just uncomfortable. <laughs> I well, mean, you have a level of conditioning, unless, but <laughs> unless you unless it's unless you can see that vision, I, there's a lot of things that are uncomfortable. Shit, competitive sports in general is uncomfortable to the to the person who's not inspired and motivated to to do that. To the person who's it's kind of like it's kind of like is training fun? Uh, no, but everything you get from training is fun, you know looking at your looking at like a trained and fit body does not look like an untrained and unfit body it looks completely different and i'm now that i'm in my 50s 
I'm really seeing that this is the decade where there's a there's a bigger and bigger separation between people and people that people that just go out for a leisurely walk. I have a neighbor that walks her dog every day at the slowest damn pace. She's my same age. I'm sure she's probably a little bit younger than me. And I'm like, put a little move on it, lady. Like, like work that walk. <laughs> like, la, da, 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 da. I'm sure the dog would appreciate it too, because anyway, whatever. I'm not, I'm, I'm not here to judge anybody else. All I'm saying is, but you're not seeing any ceilings really, which is interesting. Because a lot I'm of sorry, people what? put in place a lot, you're not seeing any ceilings to um not not only other people's capacity for change, but certainly for your own at the moment. You still don't see a ceiling. You don't I mean, how are you how do you see your own growth now that you've achieved a lot? I mean, do you still see growth in certain areas? Are you finding new areas of growth or, or what's sure. your growth now? Well, thank you for asking that because um so my own training is a I'm not really focused on any one goal right now. COVID had a lot to do with it, right? I mean, we're not getting out. I'm not, I'm not in the gym. I'm, I'm in my home gym. I'm doing clients with FaceTime. Um, you know, I mean, obviously the only, the only real goals to set is in sport, kettlebell sport. There's no swing competition until maybe we did, we did, we invent one. I don't know. Maybe we should. Um, hard to judge. Trust me. I've thought about it many times. Um, so a ceiling. So James mentioned something when we started, which is my baking. I'm a crazy baker, which is you would think complete opposite of what I do. Um, but I learned how to bake sourdough bread uh, um, over two years ago, and I became obsessed. Uh, just look at my Instagram and you'll see. Uh, uh, hang on a second. You want to know how obsessed I am with sourdough bread? Ta -da! There's my loaf. I bet. You have one everywhere you go. <laughs> everywhere I go. And I see you always. You always take a cross section, don't you? You open it up and you can see the the. Of the, course the, you can. That's yeah. the whole thing. You got to see what's inside that bread. Yeah. Um. So. Um, I, I just became driven to, to make the best bread I could possibly make because it's an art form. So do I, you know, um, it's not for everybody, but I happen to look to find things that, that inspire me to want to be the best. So, you know, no matter what I do, what I decide to do, I, you're right. I don't really put a ceiling on it. I want to be, if I, if I'm not, I want to be amongst the best. I want to have that conversation with the best. Um, which also reminds me about something that happened with the uh, interview with Rick Brown. At the end of that interview, uh, one of you said you had some questions for him, but you wanted to ask him off, off interview. And I'm like, what are those questions? I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was Pete, wasn't it? That was you, oh, Pete. Paul. It was Paul. Oh, was it Paul? Yeah. Okay, it's Paul when it's asking him again. Okay. What kind of questions did you have about your own training that I, I wanted to know about? I want to know what, what it is that you, how, how you, how you want to expand your own training. Training is training is training is training. There's progressions, there's progressions, there's progressions. There's, you know, I mean, so you've got a thirst for knowledge then. It's just feeding itself. You've got to fire this engine that needs more knowledge. It's not so much that I need more knowledge. I want one of the things that kettlebell training and being married to Mark Rifkin for 33 years now, <clears throat> I never understood the concept of progressions. And nothing is more important that in training than knowing the progressions. Even my, with my quick weight loss, right? There was still progressions. I lost 50 pounds in three months, but there was still a progression that I was following that, that time. So <clears throat> this, this, um, this in bread baking, there's a progression, you know, like people decide, oh, I'm gonna put nuts and I'm gonna put pumpkin and I'm going to put this in my bread. I'm like, you don't even know how to bake a decent loaf of 
bread? Why are you trying to be already trying to go ahead? But it's okay. Everybody's on their own journey. It's fine. You'll, you'll find out, right? You'll find out. Um, so same with training and exercise. It's like, um, there is, and this is, I think what you guys are trying to get across is there is a progression. There is a starting point. There is the next step, how you go through those next steps, how quickly you go through those next steps is up to the individual and how much they're inspired and motivated to do that. Right. Because you don't want to hold someone back, back, do you? Right. You I, even I, I, don't know, I don't even know how this conversation is going. <laughs> Can I ask Tracy? Because just to kind of, because I get the feeling already that we could probably talk for about three hours. But um, <laughs> just to, um, but, but just to, uh, just to kind of just to tie in what you what you just talked about with progression, the next kind of stage of your journey, if you like, um, from when you originally lost your first fifty pounds through mainly you know diet modification and walking. And then you got taught by Mark to do a kettlebell swing in the garage. What takes yeah. you from doing a kettlebell swing to then uh, you were featured um, in Tim Ferriss's Four Hour Body, weren't you? And you and you then went on to write your own book, The Swing, and you became right. a kettlebell instructor. And what took you from you know learning the mechanics of a swing and starting okay. doing a bit for yourself to? to then become, you know, as you've been known as the, the, the kind of the queen of the kettlebell swing. What took you on that right. portion of your journey? Right. Right. Um, okay, so Mark showed me how to do the swing and um, I like repetition, I like practice. So, uh, you know, that a lot of my hobbies in, involve, uh, you know, building a skill that takes repetition, repetition, repetition. So um, he said, okay, just do 10 sets of 10 swings and you'll be good. And um, I said, okay, fine. I didn't want to do it, by the way, because I thought it was ridiculous. It looked stupid and I wasn't going to do it, but I did. Um, so um, when I went to my first certification in 2006, so I want to say I started swinging a kettlebell around uh, June 2005. And then I had lost 100 pounds by November 2005 because I started in March. Um, so in 11 months or less, I lost hundred pounds. <clears throat> I started in January, sorry, started in January, January to November, I lost hundred pounds. So then I'm like, okay, I want to get certified. So, um, back then there was no tough mutters, Spartan races, all that, you know, balls to the wall, crazy competitions, but there was the RKC, there was the now, you know, kettlebell certification where it was three days of hard, you know, training. <clears throat> and I had already kept doing uh, longer and longer sets, 10 reps, 20 reps, 30 reps, 40 reps. And I started to time it and I saw how beautifully 10 swings fit into 15 seconds. And I'm totally about interval training for me. I love interval training. I love like, remember those gym bosses? I never used to go anywhere without a gym boss. It was like that interval timer was my boss. And um, it, you know, it, it spurred me on. It told me, go, go, stop, go, you know, I loved it. So, so I just started um, developing these timed routines on my own. It's, you know, I mean, Mark says it all the time, which is I choreograph the swing. And I, and I do. So um, I, I was just having fun doing hundreds and hundreds of reps. And then of course I learned other skills. I learned how to snatch. I learned how to clean and press and all that other stuff. So when I went to my first certification in 2000 for my certification, I didn't go to become an instructor. Oh no. I went to go kick some ass. I, I like a lot of people do. A lot of people are just regular people. They don't, they're not interested in becoming an instructor, but they want to have their ass kicked for three days. So there's still that mentality, you know, people like it, um, <clears throat> including me. I, I know a little, I know a lot more than I did back then, but I was ready for it anyway, because I had already been doing a lot of kettlebells. So at that first certification, Steve Maxwell was one of the senior instructors. They didn't have masters at the time. And there was a bunch of guys, at the time it was martial arts people, it was law enforcement, it was military. I was only one of three women there. 
So 42 years old, just coming off of a hundred pound weight loss, um, looking kind of cute if I have to say so myself. And Steve Maxwell says, all right, everybody, we're going to swing for 30 seconds. And I'm like, oh, 20 reps. I already knew 20 reps, 30 seconds. That's what it was. And all these guys, oh, 30 seconds of swings. Anyway, sorry, I'm making ugly faces. Uh, <laughs> and I'm, like, I'm like, dudes, it's 20 reps. Come on. Um, so that was kind of when I started to see that nobody was doing what I was doing. And I'm like, huh, okay. So I just continued to develop my own routines, my own training. And, and um, I saw my body change even more. I did a blog post back then. Somebody, I was looking, I was, I was looking really lean and muscular and I wasn't doing any traditional bodybuilding. Look at, I do this when I, when I go traditional bodybuilding, cause everybody thinks of, of curls, right? They think of curls. Um, and um, so I just continued to do what I was doing. And because of that, I mean, nobody's done more swings than me. I'm, 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 that's got to be true. That's got to be true. Um, so by the time Tim Ferriss, uh, by the time it was starting to be seen that the kettlebell swing was a very effective and efficient movement and accessible, um, Tim Ferriss started, uh, had been doing research on that. And he asked Pavel, okay, I'm writing this book and I want to do a chapter on the swing. Who do you know that has, has had the biggest impact in their lives uh, with this movement? So Pavel is the one that, that um, hooked me up with Tim Ferriss. And Tim Ferriss interviewed 20 people for that chapter on the swing. And he chose my story um, and my picture and my whole thing. You know, that was really, and I was in his video. If you guys haven't seen the video trailer to the four hour body, Oh my God. One of the most fun things I've ever done. Most badass thing I've ever done uh, was be part of that video trailer. Um, so anyway, so that's how I got hooked up with that. And then of course, uh, his literary agent contacted me after the four hour body to do a book specifically on, on that chapter of the book. Um, and that's how I got my own gig uh, the swing, lose the fat and get fit. And yeah, the rest is kind of history. So there you go. Did that answer your question? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I don't know if Peter or Paul has a question they want to ask before we move on. Or I mean, well, the one thing I'm wondering is you, you have so much energy and you have so much drive now and you see a real thirst for, for and a passion for a multitude of different things. What, where was that energy before the age of 40? When, what we, what, where was it being directed? Right. Right, 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 right. Good question. You know what? I, um, I, I did have some other hobbies and interests that I was very good at. Uh, they just happened to not be fitness or baking. <laughs> um, I was, uh, for a long time, I, um, I bought and sold antiques and vintage items and I would resell them at the flea market. And I was obsessed with that hobby. It was so much fun. Fun. So my focus was more of uh, interior design and, um, you know, like a lot of uh, young women who get married and have a family, they want to make their home. Like it's a big, it's a big thing now, you know, the funny thing is once I started, once I lost the weight and started getting fit, I, I, ha that has not even, it's almost like I dropped that interest. But well, now you uh, want so to get the on the walls, don't you? Yeah, don't come over because you'll see <laughs> you'll see a kettlebell a poster uh, in my house. But um, so, but but that's a good question because they're that's why I say that everybody has something that they're that they're passionate about or that they've taken the time to learn to get better at. Um, so you know, if you just uh, one, just know that it's possible, right? It's it's all the same energy. It's all the same energy. It's just where where do you want to where do you want to focus that energy? Um, who do you want to be? You know, it's like for a long, long time I was that person. You know, people would compliment me on my on my store, on my setup. What a good eye I had. You know, that was that was ego gratifying for me at the time. And then, <clears throat> um, yeah, and then it just changed. 
So, I mean, if I had the answer to that, I'd be rich. <laughs> so, I, think, I think that's a really hard, what you've just said there, who do you want to be? is a really yeah. hard thing to change, isn't it? When you've been someone for so long and then you go, right, I don't want to be that you, anymore. Who am I going to be now? And it's really difficult because you've got to start yeah. from the very beginning. Well, don't say it's difficult. Well, it is. <laughs> you know, that doesn't matter. That makes, that makes it good, though, because if everything was easy, then, you know, what's the point? <laughs> Quite fun you to know, do difficult but, things. But here's the thing. It, it, when, when you're inspired, it is easy. It's not difficult. And I think that's what I think that's what needs to change. It, it needs to be looked at as I'm making a bigger deal about this than needs to be made. Yeah. Because it's not that big of a deal. We're making it way bigger than it needs to be. You know, I mean, really. Get up, start feeling good, go for a walk, make your lunch. You know, what, whatever, like just instead we, instead, uh, I think a lot of, I can't see, I really hate to generalize. I hate to talk about what other people think when they wake up in the morning. So I'm just going to say a lot of times what I think when I wake up in the morning. And even now it's like, what did I eat yesterday? Oh my God, did I eat that? Oh, I shouldn't have eaten that. Like, oh, oh my God. Oh, well tomorrow I just wasted some yesterday. So what am I going to do to like, you know what I'm saying? It's that kind of mentality that that keeps us down so it's mm. it's more about waking up and saying oh, today is going to be a good day right today is going to be a good day what am i going to do today oh yes i'm going to go this is my first thing that's what's nice about a schedule right you already know what you're going to do tomorrow what uh, what's nice about a routine i already know you know like today i uh, i don't train on tuesdays Tuesday is great for an interview. Perfect. Because yesterday I trained. Tomorrow I train. There's no, what am I going to do tomorrow? I already know what I'm going to do tomorrow. Um, <clears throat> I don't plan my meals as much as I used to, but I pretty much eat the same things all the time. I don't have to plan them as much as I used to feel like I had to. So, you know, we're making a much bigger deal about things that need to be made of, in my opinion. So, Very so a big question I'm getting a lot at the moment because a lot of uh, I work with a lot of women um, over the age of 40 and a lot of the questions I'm getting are, are, are should training change as we age particularly for women people going through menopause and stuff like that and you know there is also a lot of narrative outside about that that, there, that, that this will affect you this is going to be a major thing and I'm not really best placed to, to give feedback on that but from your experience how have you how's your training evolved have you ever taken in into account other areas of like hormonal balance and things like that or have you just been singular in your focus um that is a great question because i have a lot of well, first of all nobody told me about menopause my mother didn't even tell me about menopause <laughs> one day i'm like oh, man it's hot around here <laughs> and I'm, like, I'm like wait a minute what so um personally my body has not changed through menopause and the other thing that happened to me when i was losing weight is i never hit a plateau i never hit a plateau so if you had to ask me why those two things didn't change for me is because of my kettlebell training. I'm sorry, that's it. That's what I believe, done. I mean, maintaining muscle mass and building muscle mass, getting a nice sweat, burning some calories. I don't really believe in that necessarily, but what I'm saying is just feeling good, feeling good about myself, my body, and, and not, like a lot of people say, oh, you're so disciplined. <laughs> and I say, I'm not disciplined, I'm greedy. I got a body that I really like and I'm not giving, giving it back. Nobody's taking it from me and I'm, I'm keeping this to whatever degree that I can keep this. And so my sister asked me the other day, she's a year older than me. She's always been small and she was always the skinny one, right? And um, she's got this little pooch belly of hers. Sorry, Chrissy. Um, and she said, uh, she's not watching this 
She's like, hey, what do I do about this? I go, well, you know, uh, you don't do any weight training. I'm gonna start there. So I'm a big believer in, in weight resistance exercise for women, especially as we get older. Uh, my own training has changed from, I've been resisting saying that my age has anything to do with it, but for sure, my recovery has um, changed. Let's put it that way. It has changed my, uh, my need for uh, probably a little bit more uh, recovery and self-care stretching and um, other things that, that, that I, I should probably incorporate into my training. Um, but then, you know, if you make everything a priority, nothing's a priority. And I tend to do the easy stuff, which is, you know, a few thousand swings. That's easy for me. I was going to say, like, you're going to need some, anybody's going to need recovery after doing half an hour of snatches with a 16 nonstop, aren't they? It's like, oh, and then just finish that. No, right? So what, my training, my training last week, I haven't posted it on YouTube though. Uh, I think it was on Friday. I did four sets of 90, 16 kilo snatches, 15 at a time, 15, 15, three times, four sets of 90 with a two minute break. So what is that? 20 minutes of snatching, uh, 360 reps with a 16 57 years old that's practically four snatch tests in the 20 minute time <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. that's not even my weight my if i were to certify i'd have to use the 12 yeah so you know one of my uh, that reminds me of probably one of my greatest accomplishments that i don't think i get enough credit for so i'm going to toot my own horn right now which is in 2013 at the first SFG certification, I was invited to participate in that by Pavel. I passed my snatch test at the age of 49 years old and six months with a 20 kilo. So I wasn't quite 50, but I used a 20 kilo for my snatch test at the first SFG in 2013 in Houston. Um, that's a pretty big deal because to my knowledge, yeah. No other woman has used a 20 kilo for her snatch test. Not to say that they couldn't, but they haven't. Mm -hmm. And that was in 2013. It's 200, 2020 now. So my record stands. Just to put that in context for anyone who doesn't know, the snatch test is 100 snatches in five minutes. Ladies have to do it with a 16. When the be when the 50, is it over 50 you do it with a 12? I think so, yeah. So you were nearly 50 and you went away, you went up a weight. <laughs> so that's that's even better. <laughs> that's brilliant. And also just for the guys who haven't met Tracy, Tracy is not a, a not you're not a big lady, are you? I don't know how tall you are, Tracy. What are you, five foot four? No, maybe. Maybe five maybe. four, you know. So yeah. it, and so in terms of proportion of size and body weight, a 20 kilo kettlebell is uh is, is serious, serious, really, really good. Fantastic. Yeah, I think I was, I was 135 pounds when I did that <clears throat> wow. certification. So what is that, 60 kilos, something like that? Yes, yeah, so it was like snatching a third, yeah, a third body weight, yeah. Third body weight, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's incredible. I mean, doing yeah. 32 kilos. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> good luck with that. <laughs> Oh, well, I'll demonstrate it next week. There's no ceilings, anything's possible. So let's well, do I've it next it. week. My fingers hurt. I hurt my finger. <laughs> I can't do it. I can't do it. Well, otherwise, but, it would. Getting, getting back to that, that question about the ceiling, is uh, the author of The Peak says that the ceilings are being lifted, right? So 100 years ago, the time for a marathon was the ceiling was here. Yeah. And that ceiling is getting higher and higher and higher. So what, why am I going to um, take uh, use somebody else's ceiling as my measurement for where I want to go with what I want to do? So yeah. there you go. Fantastic. I think Tracy, we're going to have to, we'll have to get you on again without, without a shadow of a doubt, because uh, we could certainly keep, keep talking and asking questions. We haven't even, I don't think we've even scratched the surface, but um, I think we will have to uh, have to start to wrap up now because it has been a, uh, you know, we, we, well, probably about 50, 55 minutes, something like that at the moment, but it's been absolute pleasure speaking to you. I told you I was, I told you I was excited to, to, to,
to have the conversation. So I, I really appreciate that you've given me this opportunity to talk about this. So yeah. If people, if people do want to, uh, which I'm sure they will, find out more about you, uh, you know, connect with you online, follow, you mentioned your uh, Instagram and that sort of thing. Um, how can people, uh, you know, connect with you and get in touch with you and, and follow what you're doing, Tracy? Um, well, I think that the best way to follow what I'm doing currently is to find me on YouTube. So I post my own workouts uh, during COVID. I posted a lot, weekly workouts. If you wanna do one of my workouts, one of my swing workouts. Um, uh, of course, if you haven't read my book, you need to read my book. Um, it's, a, it's a fairly easy read. It's got a lot of really great information, especially if you're just a regular person like me, all right? This book is for a regular person. Um, there's 15 workouts in my book, The Swing. I know you had a picture of it, but you know, yeah, there it is. I, I also have a signed copy myself in the gym, so. <laughs> so there, there are 15 workouts in my book that are all on YouTube. You can find them for free. So if you want to start, uh, if you know how to swing, great. If you don't know how to swing, uh, there's nothing better than personal instruction, of course. But um, I developed a couple of really nice uh, um, uh, uh methods of, 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 of getting yourself in a good hinge position, uh, practicing an air swing, timing your swings, all kinds of really nice things for beginners, regular people, uh, free workouts. Uh, so, so if you haven't done that, I encourage everybody, especially if you're a trainer and you haven't read my book, shame on you, but that's another story. <laughs> um, but you can find me on YouTube. Uh, of course, I'm on Facebook and Instagram, but I'm currently obsessed with bread and cookies. Um, so uh, you might not see a whole lot of kettlebell stuff there, but you know, I go in and out, right? We are constantly growing and evolving people. We've got different uh, interests in a lot of things, but there's always the main, uh, uh, the, uh, the thing that they all have in common for me is it's about progressions, increasing my skill, practice, purposeful, deliberate practice. Love it. Um, anyway, you're right. I can go on. You can stop me now. You can stop me now. <laughs> cool. We will definitely uh, try and hook up with you again uh, in the near future, Tracy, and speak to you again. But uh, it was an absolute pleasure uh, speaking to you. What we'll get, Pip, uh, um, Pete will probably attach some of those links to your, yeah, he's got written down. Just, can I say one thing? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, have a, I, have a, I have a workout subscription business, sorry. See, I'm not always trying to sell something. I apologize for that. So if you want weekly workouts, if you want to know exactly what I'm doing yesterday, I just uploaded a video. Uh, I have a subscription service. You can, it's $6.99 a month, something ridiculously inexpensive. Um, there are over, I just counted them this morning, there are over 200 original, new and original swing workouts. Over 200, you can get right now for under, you know, five pounds, probably about that, that, that much money. All right. So uh, you'll find that at gumroad.com, gumroad.com slash swing lean. Swing lean is the name of my uh, uh, program. So there you go. Thank you. Fantastic. Fantastic. So, uh, yes, thank you so much, Tracy. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you and lovely to catch up with you. Um, and we will attach all the links and things to the podcast so people can click straight through and connect with you on social media and, and, uh, and YouTube and, and, and your subscription uh, membership site as well would be it would be fantastic. Um, do you want to say goodbye, uh, Mr. Peter Lance? Goodbye, Mr. Peter Lance. <laughs> Sorry, I'm writing. I'm writing all this down. <laughs> Do you want to say goodbye, Mr. Paul Bassett? Goodbye. Okay. And uh, would you like to say goodbye to everybody, Tracy? Goodbye. See you next time. Excellent. Thank you very much, guys. We'll see you next week on episode eleven. Thank you, guys. Take care. You've been listening to Health Odyssey with Peter Land, Paul Bassett, and James Saint Pierre. To get your regular fix of hype-free health, you can subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your favorite podcasts. You can find out more on today's and other topics at healthodyssey.com or find us on Facebook or Instagram by searching for Health Odyssey.